So we have to talk about Danielle Smith and the Tucker Carlson visit. Because the whole thing was a mess. Like this photo alone, where do we begin? The man currently prohibited from practicing psychology because he abuses people on Twitter? The frozen dinner heir who lost his job at Fox News after lying about Dominion voting machines a bunch? Like that's why he's on Twitter, he got fired. Or Conrad Black, a man who presumes to lecture us about Canadian issues after renouncing his Canadian citizenship to become a British Lord. Real man of the people stuff. This is who Danielle Smith is choosing to align herself with, and it's ridiculous. She sat down with Tucker Carlson on stage for 16 minutes. And of course, she made it very clear she doesn't agree with Tucker Carlson, she just gives him all of her time and attention. And this is incredibly irresponsible. A reminder, this happened literally the day after there was a politically motivated attack on Edmonton City Hall. And rather than be responsible, Danielle Smith openly mused about visiting the Coots blockade people in jail. She also said, quote, I wish you would put Stephen Gilbo in your crosshairs. This sort of political rhetoric is dangerous. This is just Danielle Smith incredibly irresponsibly catering to extremists. She is aligning herself with the most extreme elements of the political right and doesn't care who gets hurt, doesn't care about the risks that she's taking. There's a real danger to what she's doing here. Between Coots and the Edmonton attack, it's very clear that there is a risk of political violence in Alberta. And this sort of rhetoric and these sort of events just fuel it. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith pictured here trying to read off her neighbor's notes. Danielle, it's a test. Keep your eyes on your own paper. Anyways, she's stealing ideas from Ontario. Specifically, their affinity for giving free money to Loblaws. This time, it's $77 million. And it's even worse than you think. You see, Danielle Smith and the Alberta UCP have been working overtime to break healthcare in Alberta. And now that there's simply no healthcare to be accessed, they're handing it off to private profit. They're giving Shoppers Drug Mart $77 million to add primary care clinics to 103 locations. That's an increase of 44 locations over the current number. And that means that over 200,000 Albertans have visited the clinics. Which means that they're making money off you. So the question you have to ask here is, why is the provincial government handing this responsibility off to clinics run by a private company rather than running them through the government? The answer's simple. Because Shoppers Drug Mart is going to be able to charge for some of the treatments that they offer. And that's where the money's gonna go. But there's more here, because the commodity being exchanged isn't just money, it's also you. This is the Alberta government sending a mass amount of foot traffic to Shoppers Drug Mart, giving their business a significant boost and giving them $77 million to do it. Everybody wins except Albertans. You just get to give more money to Galen Weston. Lucky you. Alberta oil company is pictured here in an artist's rendition. Side note, Hexus from Fern Gully was a weird villain. Like, they made Pollution the coolest character in the movie. Anyways, turns out the oil companies are doing that thing they do again. Lying. And destroying the planet in the process. So a new study in the journal Science had a look at the emissions from the oil industry in Alberta. And what they found was astonishing. So historically our ways of measuring emissions haven't been great. A lot of them have been self-reported. And a lot of the emissions are hard to measure. And act surprised, the oil industry tends to measure things pretty generously. Well, this study used aircraft-based sensors to detect the emissions from the oil industry. And what they found is that the oil sands industry underreported their emissions by 1900 to 6300%. The vast majority of which were intermediately volatile or semi-volatile compounds. The measured emissions are about 1% of that. And what this actually means is that the organic carbon emissions are equivalent to all other sources across Canada combined. The emissions from the oil sands are massive and massively underreported. They're being underreported by a factor of as much as 64. This is a huge problem because the data that we get from the oil industry is used to make policy. If that data is nowhere near accurate, then we're making bad policy. Because if the measurements are off by 6,300%, that's a serious problem. We need serious solutions. It's probably going to involve a wood nymph and a bat. The squeak squeak kind, not the home run kind. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau pictured here trying very hard to kill a fly. Everybody thinks he was applauding. No, just a timing thing. For the record, he missed. Anyways, 
I want to take a second to break down a new story about Justin Trudeau that really highlights the underlying problems with the Liberal Party. And it has to do with this guy, Liberal MP Ken McDonald. You see, a couple of days ago, Ken couldn't have been more clear. He called for a leadership review. And what he said was very reasonable. People are fairly frustrated, and it's worth having a leadership review to make sure that people are on board with the direction things are going. He's suggesting that the party needs to do some serious soul-searching, and he's not wrong. And he was asked very directly, quote, So you think at least there should be a leadership review in the Liberal Party? To which he responded, yes. Until he walked it back a couple days later. Because <laughs> of course he did. He insists that he wasn't calling for a leadership review, even though he was directly asked, are you calling for a leadership review? And he said, yes. Quote, the intent of my recent public comments was not to personally call for a leadership review, and I'm not calling for one now. You think there should be a leadership review? Yes. I could see how you could get confused. Now, this whole thing's ridiculous, but there's a serious underlying issue. Why are the liberals not willing to look inward? Like, he's clearly walked this back because he got a very angry phone call. I think that much is clear. So the question you have to ask is, why is Justin Trudeau afraid of a leadership review? It's because he knows it would go badly for him. The question is, can Justin Trudeau win another election? And the answer is probably not. Regardless of where you stand on his policy, there is a huge amount of the electorate who just will never vote for him and hate him with a consuming passion. Regardless of what you think about Justin Trudeau as a politician, as a leader, whatever, from a purely strategic standpoint, a leadership review makes sense. The only hope the liberals have for the next election is a new leader. I really sincerely believe that. Otherwise, Justin Trudeau's unwillingness to take a leadership review or to step aside is going to hold the Liberals back. He's gone from being their greatest strength to being their greatest weakness. And the fact that leadership review calls are happening and then being very abruptly walked back is probably an indicator of that. Okay, let's talk about this. Every time I criticize a conservative political figure, somebody chimes in and says, I'd love to see you debate them. No! The medium of debate is largely dead. For one very simple reason, it's theatrics. Like, the vast majority of internet debates that you'll see are just cloud chasing. It's just two people repeating talking points at one another for attention. Or in the case of folks like Ben Shapiro, it's just one person talking as fast and loud as they can to overwhelm the other person. It has nothing to do with facts or information. You don't want to see an actual debate, you just want to see them yell talking points at me. Because in order for a debate to work, or get you anywhere, people need to be willing to listen. They aren't, it's just talking. It's a waste of time. I have no interest in debating Tucker Carlson. I have no interest in debating Danielle Smith. I have a number of inanimate objects in my room that would be roughly as productive to debate with. I think this mug's got some interesting ideas. It's a better listener than Danielle, despite the lack of ears. Okay, this triggering liberals thing is ridiculous. If your whole political identity just wound up in who you piss off, why? What's the point? Congratulations, you angered people you don't like. Now what? Great, you've antagonized people. Congratulations. Your life seems like a rich, full oyster. And this is the larger issue with just the right in general. They don't have ideas to make things better. So instead, they just try to make things worse for specific groups they don't like. Gotta trigger those libs. And this shows up again and again. With policies that are intentionally meant to hurt the unhoused. With policies that are intentionally meant to hurt unions. With policies that are intentionally meant to hurt education or healthcare. Or children. Or women. These all come up all the time. And they're just to trigger liberals. Here's the thing. I don't know any other political identity that's constantly trying to cook up policies to hurt people they don't like. Just the right. How do you tell yourself you're the good guy? I love when people confidently make these claims on TikTok. Saying that teachers get EI in the summer. No, they don't. Specifically excluded. A teacher who is on a temporary contract who gets laid off over the summer might be able to collect EI, but even then it's tricky. But if a teacher is on a continuing contract, that contract continues over the summer. During that period of time, they are not working and they are not getting paid, but they are still technically employed, and as a result, they cannot collect EI. And this is an important reminder that people in comment sections have no idea what they're talking about. You can just make up stuff in there. People do it all the time. Like, it takes a 10-second Google to find the answer to this. But they're not going to do that, are they? 
They'd rather just get mad, post their hot take, and then an emoji at the end. I could probably make my face do that. <laughs> It fascinates me how angry conservatives are about basic parts of speech. Like, this person's mad that kids might learn pronouns in school. Like, what do you expect them to do? Talk like cavemen? Little Johnny, go to bathroom now. Johnny, come back when finished. That's not how this works. Pronouns are a basic part of speech. Like, you is a pronoun. I, pronoun. Dude, pronoun. Bro, pronoun. Guy, pronoun. So... Dude, bro, guy, chill. They're basic parts of speech. They're not going anywhere. If you're mad that pronouns are being taught, what else are you upset about? Addition? Subtraction really triggers some folks. And don't even get me started on long division. That fills me with a boiling rage. Just makes me sit there and be like, dude, bro, guy. Anytime anybody talks about the far left being in power in Canada, I always ask them who. And without fail, they always say a moderate politician. I'm sorry to tell you, Justin Trudeau is a very moderate politician. It's a real problem. He doesn't really stand for much. But if you think he's far left, all you're doing is loudly announcing that you don't understand what the far left is. The vast majority of provinces are run by conservative premiers and have been for decades. Prior to nine years of Justin Trudeau, we had a whole lot of Harper not the far left. Like, there is no evidence that the far left is in power in any place in Canada. Like, if you think that's true and you want to point at a politician you think is on the far left, let's define far left first. Like, let's use the broadest definition of communism, shall we? Moneyless, classless, stateless. Who is advocating for that? Who is advocating for the dissolution of the financial system, the state, and the class system? Oh wait, or are they all just giving corporate subsidies? Because that's not leftism. This person's talking about one of the big topics du jour in education. Failing kids. Holding them back. And it's a terrible idea. Consistently. So if a kid gets held back, you gotta ask yourself, why did that happen? And who are we blaming? So in education, we know for a fact that there are very few things that have an actual negative effect. Kids just naturally develop and grow. That's how their brains work. And so the list of things that has a negative impact on the development is really short. So this is from a major meta-analysis called Visible Learning by a guy named John Hattie. And if you look right here, holding students back has a negative effect. It worsens kids' outcomes by almost a full third of a grade level. So why do the thing that we know doesn't work and hurts kids? Well, it's because of things like this. Because of kids with different needs in the same classroom. So because those needs are going unmet, the instinct is to punish the kid. Really? Is it their fault their needs weren't being met? Like, they're a kid. We gotta ask ourselves, what are the inputs in this situation that led to things getting to this point? Like, was that kid able to receive proper supports during the year that they were struggling? Were their needs met during that year where they were struggling? Did they get the remediation and intensive supports that they needed? Or were there simply not enough available? Not enough time, not enough EAs, not enough specialized teachers. Why does the blame go solely on the kid? And this is the issue. If a kid fails in school, it's not just the kid's failure. It's a systemic failure. We need to address it as such. The solution isn't punishment. The solution is remediation, helping the kid. Not holding them back, pushing them forward. But with adequate supports to do so. I love when anybody calls Justin Trudeau a dictator, because it's always followed up with the next step, which is their plan to remove that dictator through an open election. Pierre Poilievre's gonna beat that dictator in an open and fair election. That's, that's often how we remove dictators. Begging people to learn a basic level of understanding of political systems. If you genuinely think Justin Trudeau is a dictator, what's your plan? Because generally an election is not how one gets rid of a dictator. So let's hear it. What do you got? Or is it possible that you're just blowing smoke? Because you know he's not a dictator. Like, there are real dictators in the world, and Trudeau ain't one of them. He's democratically elected, and you're trying to get rid of him democratically. The problem is, using that sort of language just escalates things. It makes it impossible to have real discussions. Like, you don't want to talk politics, you just want to call them names. Sorry to say, that's boring. You're being boring. Be more interesting. Mm. 
I'm always fascinated on here when people get very upset with me playing with filters. This is fun. I'm having fun. Some people get very upset with fun. Fun really bothers them. But here's the thing. I make TikToks because I like it. Spring. And the fact that somebody used a bunch of their free time to make a filter that lets me launch my head all over the screen is fun. I highly suggest you try to insert more joy into your life. Because if you hang out in TikTok comment sections and antagonize people, that's not much fun. You know what is fun? Filters! Spring!